Now is the time to act. That's why we've created a blueprint. Working for a future where carbon-free resources power the economy. Everything from homes and businesses to cars, trucks, and mass transit. We're a leader in the U.S. in clean energy, integrating solar, wind, and storage throughout the grid. 43% of the power we deliver to Southern California comes from carbon-free resources. And we're moving toward 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2045. We're accelerating the move to zero carbon transportation, working to put 7.9 million zero emission vehicles on California's roads by 2030 working to keep electricity affordable, reducing air pollution in disadvantaged communities, working to strengthen communities' resilience to climate change,
transforming the way market leaders across the globe manage energy through advanced analytics. Helping global customers quantify energy risk, reduce carbon footprints, and meet sustainability goals. Edison International. Leading the charge to power a cleaner, brighter future for everyone. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us this morning um, here at COP26. We are, um, of course, an international conference, but at the end of the day, a lot of the work gets done at the subnational level, at the state and local level. And so this morning, I'm pleased to have a conversation around the critical role that subnationals play, and particularly in California, the trajectory we are on to achieve our 2030 climate and clean air goals that are some of the most ambitious um, in the nation and globally. Um, joining me this morning are Chairman of the California Energy Commission, David Hochschild, and uh, Edison International President and CEO, Pedro Pizarro. Thank you both for joining me this morning. Um, so we're going to be talking this morning about how California's trajectory and um, how we will ensure that we have a just and equitable transition to a clean energy economy, one that ensures that no communities are left behind. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Oops. Okay, so as I mentioned, COP26 is an international conference. And it sends a message really to be here. California has a strong delegation presence, both at the agency level as well as in, in the legislature. So what do Edison International and the California Energy Commission State of California hope to achieve by being here during the COP26? Yeah, well, certainly uh, California um, is a force. Our economy is the fifth largest in the world. We're the second fastest growing economy in the world after China. Uh, and we want to send the message that this has been good. This move to climate solutions and clean energy has been good for our state and good for our economy. Um, and to share some of the, the lessons we've learned, I think one of the most exciting um, things going on in the state of California today is around transportation electrification. Uh, exactly a year ago, the governor signed an executive order mandating that we get to 100% zero emission vehicles for, for new vehicles sold by 2035. And um, that sector in our state is booming. We are gonna hit a million electric vehicles sold here shortly. Um, we have electric vehicles are our number one export in the state of California. We got 34 companies manufacturing EVs. We're making about a thousand electric vehicles a day. Uh, and this is good on, on many levels. It's job opportunities, it's energy independence. It's, uh, and as we move forward with supporting the grid, I think we're gonna see more and more nexus between electric vehicles and, and the grid. And so uh, certainly sharing that. Um, and I would point out that because we have 100% clean energy mandate for our electric grid, as we are adding things like electric vehicles, which use more electricity, that also creates renewable energy jobs in wind and solar and geothermal that we need to supply all that clean electricity. So that's one of the main things we're, we're focused on. David, that makes a lot of sense. And from our perspective as Edison, uh, you know, we wanna be here first to support the state. Uh, secondly, we have over the course of the last several years, really tried to bring some thought leadership to the table not only for the state, but for the industry. Um, I'm here not only with my Edison hat on, but I'm also here with my hat on as vice chair of the Edison Electric Institute, which uh, is a, a trade group for the 40 plus uh, investor owned utilities across the country that serves 70% of the country's load. And so I'm seeing our peers in other states also having the same discussion. Uh, and I think that as Californians, we can help drive this uh, clean energy transition. You know, we've we've over the last five years or so spent a lot of time looking at fundamental analysis, not only for our sector within the walls of their industry, but looking at uh, what it will take to decarbonize the entire California economy. And we do think, you know, like to your point, David, that that's instructive for other economies since we're the world's fifth largest. And so we do see a path there that's feasible. We think it can be affordable. And we think it's a model that can be used in other places. We want to share that. But at the same time, we, we know that we, we don't know it all. 
So we're here also to learn. Uh, what I find interesting though is that you see this common theme across all the economies where folks are looking at the same set of tools. We need a lot of tools in the toolbox, but some of the key ones are, to your point, starting with clean electricity to power much of the economy, most of the economy, or using that clean electricity to electrify sectors like transportation, but not just transportation, right? It's buildings, it's even some industrial processes, right? Um, it's also acknowledging that, at least with today's technology, not every sector of the economy, not every application lends itself easily to electrification. So we do need uh, clean fuels to power the rest. And we also need carbon capture right, uh, to, to bring it all into balance. But we think if you optimize across all of those, you can get to a solution that is affordable for customers. And you know, maybe final quick punchline that, that we were here to share is that in our analysis, we see the average California customer actually spending a third less than they do today across their total energy bill. Electricity will be higher, right? Because they'll be using more electricity, but they'll be using probably zero gasoline, they'll be using a lot less gas. And so because of the efficiency of electric uh, applications, uh, we see them spending a third less overall. That's good for uh, customers, that's good for the economy. Exactly. So one of the things that I have seen um, just in my short time here has been California standing out, David, as you talked about, as a model, not just of the policies that we have in place, but I also see a strong partnership between government and the private sector with autos, utilities, charging companies, et cetera. So how, how, did, how did California achieve that? I guess I'd love to hear your perspectives on how we got to a place where you do see strong partnership, public-private partnership in California to achieve really ambitious goals that we've set for ourselves. Yeah, I think public-private partnerships are the way to go. Um, really the only way that you can be really effective. Um, and actually you and I are involved in a great example of that this organization a nonprofit called Veloz, which is getting utilities and state agencies and auto companies and charger companies and environmental groups, environmental justice, all together to speak with one clear, loud voice in support of adoption of electric vehicles. We ran a $5 million ad campaign uh, to promote electric vehicle adoption. I think it's been very successful. Former Governor Schwarzenegger was instrumental in that. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, is needed because Otherwise, you have sort of dissonant efforts that are not coordinated and you're less effective. Um, and I think, you know, what's happening is many of the environmental aims that, you know, previously people thought only environmental groups could advance, you know, it's really now industry leading. If you want to bring transportation, electric, mainstream you got to be working with the big companies making electric cars and you know they're they're really ripe for the engagement I've gotten to know the CEO of Ford Jim Farley who's a great example of this you know he's coming out next year with the electric Ford F-150 Lightning 300 mile range vehicle bi-directional power it's a really path-breaking uh, milestone and you know he wants to engage with the state and to think through together how do we make the best use of this and that's wonderful and so we have to lean into that and everybody's got to get out of their silo uh and, because i think we're at a, at a moment i just would say you know um the moment that we're in in california for people who are not living in the west coast of the united states may not fully understand what's happening with the fires this is the most severe wildfires we've ever seen in the history of the state okay we had a day last year uh, it was so dark. I live in the Bay Area. It was so dark that at, at, at midday, it was like midnight. You know, the street lights came on in my street. That's how, and my kids got sick. I got sick. We had to, you know, we left for a couple of weeks. It was so bad. So there's a level of urgency here that's new. And I think that, you know, there's, I really believe in that, um, you know, the, the Chinese script for the word crisis is made up of the script for the word danger combined with the script for the word opportunity. I really believe that. And so one of the opportunities inside this, I think it's getting people to be bolder. And we have things like the electric vehicle, you know, mandate on new construction for, for new vehicles and other, you know, big, bold policies and to get out of the silos and work more closely together. And that's what this, this week is all about. Let me add a bit to that. Uh, I step back and I think about the level of investment that will be needed to have this decarbonization transition actually happen, right? Uh, just in terms of the electric sector side in California, in our analysis, we saw that for the 
80 gigawatts of new renewables that will be needed statewide by 2045, and the 30 gigawatts of battery storage uh, or storage that will be needed, uh, much of that will be batteries. Uh, and for the grid investments to support interconnecting those pieces of equipment, that alone is around $250 billion of investment that will be needed between now and 2045. Uh, that, that's just the grid part. <laughs> All right, so think about the capital investment required across every other sector of the economy. And it's investment by government entities in terms of big scale infrastructure. It's investment by private uh, entities like companies. It's investment by consumers, right? You know, how do you get uh, and help consumers uh, to make sure they're making that next choice of a vehicle, an electric one, or their next water heater, or their, uh, you know, next stove? Uh, and so, it's trillions of dollars of investment, not only in our state, but then when you magnify that across the US economy and across the global economy, that doesn't happen with just one entity working it, right? That requires a, a true partnership. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Jim Farley and we've gotten to know him pretty well as well. I have the privilege of co-chairing a task force that our uh, EEI has on tra transportation electrification. So we've been working with Ford, with GM, with charging companies, with uh, large fleet managers, right, who are going to be making the first major scale purchases of, of vehicles. And you realize the level of cooperation and collaboration that's required to have such a retooling of the economy happen and to happen in short order, right? Because when you're talking about the California example, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into this in a little bit here, but uh, we're not just focused on 2045 and net zero, we're focused on that waypoint of 2030 that the state actually built into law, right? We have law in the state that says that we will have a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions relative to 1990 levels by 2030. So last time I checked, clock's ticking, that's eight years away, and as massive investment is going to be required across the economy just for that eight-year mark. So, you know, you need a strong partnership across all sectors and across government and private industry and in con consumers to get there. Pedro, you brought up this great milestone that we have eight years uh, right around the corner for for many, especially when you have to make investments to hit, to hit it, 2030. And um, as much as California has done, and it was great to see that it achieved its 2020 milestone of hitting 1990 levels early, uh, it looks like we are not on track at the moment to achieve the 2030 target. And so just curious what you think, both of you think, uh, is the most important thing that we need to get done uh, to ensure that we hit the 2030 target. Well, David, maybe, maybe I could go first on this one to just frame how we see the gap, right? And uh, our company has put out a series of white papers for the last several years. It started with one in 2017 that talked about 2030 and you know, what we need to be done across the entire economy to get there. And, followed it up with a Pathway 2045 white paper that led to the results I just quoted a bit ago. We had one uh, in 2020 on reimagining the grid to make all that happen from a grid perspective. But around a month ago, we put out a paper that's called Mind the Gap. And uh, it's focused on 2030 and what is that gap that California is experiencing now relative to where we need to go. It starts with good news, right? Because the state has done a really good job uh, in keeping overall greenhouse gas emissions relatively flat from 1990 levels while the economy grew. If you look more recently, uh, it, counting from 2005, the state has reduced greenhouse gas emissions across the entire economy by about 1% per year. Uh, at that same time, the economy grew by around 3% per year. Right? So that's a remarkable achievement. Now here's the gap part. In order to get to 2030 and that 40% reduction, we, the state as a whole, will have to figure out how to quadruple that rate because we calculated we will need a 4.1% uh, decrease per year starting now through 2030 in order to get to the 40% mark. That's the gap, right? And when we decompose that gap or look at the components, uh, I was, you know, there's a lot of assumptions here, right? But that can add up to some place between 30 and 90 million tons of a shortfall in terms of reduction by 2030. If you look at the more uh, optimistic side of that and just focus on the 30 million, you know, we see that uh, if you look at where the power sector is headed right now in terms of just uh, uh, how we're decarbonizing uh, uh, power itself, that's pretty much on track 
but it accounts for maybe about 10% of that shortfall for, uh, for, for 2030. Transportation electrification accounts for maybe a third of the, of the gap, but I'm actually encouraged with transportation electrification because it has good momentum. So it, that, that needs a good push, but I think we have a lot of pieces in motion. What really worries me is building electrification. That really has not moved much. That is a relatively smaller component of the of emissions. The buildings are a smaller component than transportation, yet buildings account for, we think, a quarter of the gap to 2030. So, you know, give you a lot of numbers there, but it shows you that we need significant pushes across multiple tools. And probably the tool that worries me the most, where I think we need to put the most emphasis uh, in terms of uh, not just a, a push, but a kickstart is the building electrification side. And I know that's uh, really, uh, you know, in focus of the California Energy Commission. Yeah, I, I will share some about that. I just wanted to first say um, really a compliment to you and, and Caroline and the team at SCE for these white papers in this vision, you know, utilities, um, I don't know how to say this diplomatically, they're, uh -oh. not, they're not really known for producing a lot of vision, I'll put it that way, that typically utilities in the United States, their main objective is to continue what, doing what they're doing last year and deliver returns to shareholders. And, and you guys have really um, leaned in to, to building this clean energy future and put out a bold vision. I think it's been incredibly impactful. I think you're leaders in the, in the utility industry and have very positively impacted, I think, the direction we're going as a state. And I just want to thank you for that and acknowledge Thanks because so I, do, I do think that the future, really, we're building this 100% clean energy grid. Okay, so we, to be clear, we did that in 2018. We passed SB 100. Now there are 18 states in the United States that have adopted 100% clean energy laws, and President Biden has set that as the goal for the country. In California, we're getting almost two thirds of our electricity today from carbon-free sources. And really the strategy, a core of the strategy is really to expand the reach of this clean electricity into transportation, displaced fossil fuels, and into the building sector. So one of the things I'm happy to, to share some good news about is we set the codes for new construction. Uh, we build about 100,000 new homes a year in California. And we have now adopted in August the strongest decarbonization and pro-electrification code in the United States. So it's going to require every home to be electric ready. It's going to require one of the major end uses to flip either water heating or space heating. They can they can pick. And um, is the the result of that is now cheaper to build all electric than it is to build uh, with gas. Uh, and then on top of that, there's about 50 cities in the state that have gone out ahead of state code and have adopted some form of an electrification preference or mandate. Um, the, the, the good news I would say that's sort of hidden within this whole effort is what I call market transformation, which is you know, a great example is I came out of Silicon Valley, the solar industry. I got in the field 20 years ago, utility scale solar projects in California were 50 cents a watt. Okay, so now we're sub two cents a watt, and that's really not complicated how you do that. It's three things, it's innovation, automation, and scale, and it's mostly scale. And we're seeing this th same trend play out in batteries. So lithium ion batteries have dropped 90% in the last decade, okay? We went from $1,000 a kilowatt hour in 2011 to 120 today. When you get to 100, that's when EVs become cheaper without subsidies compared to conventional vehicles. Um, and we're seeing that play out in other technologies, including electric heat pumps. And so part of the game here, the strategy, is really to adopt policies that are going to scale these industries and help them get the cost down. And then they can uh, go off, compete, and win on their own. And I think that's the right role for government. You come in, you have a temporary exercise, which you're scaling a new technology, get it to scale, and it'll be cheaper, and then goes off on its own. And so I think that's that's one of the things we do our job right. Um, this is like we're just pushing the boulder, and then it's going to roll, you know, downhill on its own. That's the that's the game. Can I pick up on that just really briefly? I, I totally agree, and I would add another angle to that role of government, right? So absolutely agree that that's, there's a role for incentives, subsidies in a targeted way to help jumpstart uh, new technologies. I think there's another role too, and it's supporting uh, those who can uh, are more challenged in affording the transition. And so when you think about our disadvantaged communities, our low income customers, uh, they need the help, right? And we need to make sure that this transition is one that is just and that isn't leaving communities behind. So when you look at our Southern California Edison utility, 
uh, you know, we have about a third of our residential customers who qualify for low income assistance. And so as you look at our programs, like our transportation electrification program, we got support from our uh, Public Utilities Commission to have uh, this, this program. It's a $436 million uh, uh, program that will bring 38,000 chargers to Southern California over the next four or five years. But uh, just about half of that funding is being targeted towards low income and disadvantaged communities, as well as uh, multiple unit dwellings. So we need to make sure that I think that there's a special role for government, you know, working with the industry to make sure they will bring that added support to those who need it the most, because otherwise it's going to be an uneven transition. And it, it, what's, what would be tragic about that is that, it, in fact, it is those communities that in many ways are bearing their larger share of the brunt of the impact of climate change. Yeah. So two years ago, Pedro and I were at COP, and um, it was a very different feel from the federal level. And uh, it, these sea change since the election with a very strong federal presence. It's great to see Secretary Kerry here and Gina McCarthy and a number of administration leaders. Um, how do you see the, the state doing more, less, differently um, to align with what's happening in Washington? Well, breath of fresh air, as far as I'm concerned. I think the state of California had something like 100 lawsuits against the Trump administration. Uh, and now we really have um, a partnership and, and an ally. Uh, and I met with Secretary Granholm yesterday. I think she is a fantastic addition to the cabinet. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really seeing like, okay, how can we how can we really partner to bring these things mainstream? Um, you know, it, I, I don't want to um, understate how big of a cleanup job this is. There's a lot, just as an example, my colleague, uh, Janae Scott, who was a commissioner with me for eight years, she had been at the Department of Interior uh, in the Obama administration before she joined the Energy Commission. Then she went back after the, after leaving the Energy Commission to to be you know uh, assistant to to Secretary Holland. She said when she left the Department of Interior, there were over 100 people working on renewables. When she got back, there was four people. Right, so they had this totally dismantled and eviscerated, and that's been the case throughout you know many agencies, including EPA. So it's a big cleanup job to kind of restore the ability of these agencies to do their job, and that's to protect public health and protect the environment and advance clean energy. And so um, that work is ongoing. We've got a lot of really committed um, public servants. I, I would say one other thing that's just important to remember as we look ahead, which is that. The history of fossil fuel subsidies in this country is very long, okay? So the, the goal of an energy subsidy typically is to help mature a new industry, but we have been doing the oil depletion allowance, that began in 1926, okay, and continues in perpetuity. And so when you look at how the federal government has treated renewables versus fossil fuel, there's really three differences. The fossil fuel subsidies are more numerous, they've been around much, much longer, and they typically don't expire. Meanwhile, the solar and wind subsidies have been on this very short stop-start cycle. Um, and that's a disadvantage. And it's part of the reason why states like New York and California are going so big on this is to kind of help level the playing field. But that's one of the things I do hope gets addressed because it, it, it does dictate higher costs for renewables when there's not that level of certainty. So that's one of the main things I'm hoping we get, frankly, in the next few weeks is long-term tax credits for solar, for wind, for storage, for transmission, for EVs. Those things will really help a lot. Yeah, I, I think you covered it well. I mean, I, the piece I would add quickly is that uh, we've gone from California being viewed as that crazy state over there on the left, right, uh, with yeah. lots of litigation, et cetera, to now being a real partner and being a model. And so I see that also on the industry side, right? Um, I had a good meeting yesterday with a group of U.S. and a couple of global CEOs and Secretary Kerry, right? Yeah. And uh, it was interesting, David and, and Caroline, how much of that discussion kept coming back to California themes. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so we're, we're having a discussion right. there about what the country needs to do and how that can get exported yeah. to yep. support other economies. And, uh, you know, yeah. a lot of the time was talking about transportation electrification in California or even some of the challenges we're facing. Remember, like, remember what permanent. Gandhi said. First, they ignore you. Then they mock you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Right. So. <laughs> So it's, I, I'm excited about yeah. this. It's a good opportunity. Um, but the reality is we have a big challenge to solve ourselves in California. Right. We're, we're not done, right? right? Really proud of what the state has done. But at the same time, I am worried. Yeah. I'm yeah. worried we may not make it to 2030, right? 
And so that's why I think we need to be very aggressive in terms of staking these, uh, you know, these programs out that are needed and uh, recognizing that there is a cost to these things we're doing now, but it has a long-term payout. And that's one that we'll need to make sure that we're helping not only policymakers with, but consumers with as well, right? Uh, it's not just about the cents per kilowatt hour. It's about the dollars per million tons of GHG that you can remove, right? And so recognizing that the investments we're making today are critical for the long-term sustainability of the state's economy and of the planet, really, uh, the climate, uh, it's something we need to keep front and center. And now we have a much better partner for that in Washington. You know, so one of the things that California is known for is innovation um, in technology and advancing not just policies, but in the technology. So do you think about our history um, and some of the things that have come out of California, thinking ahead, what are some of the innovative technologies that you think hold promise for California to achieve its 2030 goals and to really help nationally and globally um, states and, and the international entities achieve the the car the, the goals of 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 cop yeah so uh i love this stuff uh, i can go on a long time so shut me off if i'm <laughs> going to but but i would say um first of all we're getting 53 percent of u.s clean tech venture capital is coming into california that's not an accident that's because we as a state are investing very heavily in that and leveraging that and so a couple areas i'm really excited about one is just what i call um helping everything that connects to the grid be a good citizen of the grid so that's just smart technology uh that that lets you know when you have a electric car or any electric device uh that lets it be uh, easily uh, adjusted so that you know we want an electric vehicle happy hour when we have surplus solar in the middle of the day right that kind of thing companies like Ohm Connect that are helping do demand response uh, and making that easy with a focus on low income customers. So they sign up, they can earn, you know, $150, $200 a year doing these, uh, you know, shut offs of their, of their appliances when the grid needs it. Um, things like that. I think storage has been particularly exciting. We funded Form Energy. They just raised $365 million in their latest round to do really, really low cost uh, uh, utility scale storage uh, and a bunch of other chemistries, next generation lithium ion, which is going to, um, you know, increase energy density and, and, and reduce costs. So um, I, I would say generally, I mean, there are revolutionary technologies, but but I have seen a lot of promise in what I'd call evolutionary technologies. Just you look at solar panels today. Okay, it's not radically different than it was 30 years ago. It's just every year you know it's crystal and silicon got a little bit cheaper a little bit more efficient the wafer got a little bit thinner um, they got better at manufacturing and you had this incremental approach that got you from 50 cents to two cents a kilowatt hour in 20 years which is pretty darn good and i think you see that with things like lithium ion too it's not radical change but small change so i'm a big believer in every year you know very practical very incremental changes over time can yield a revolutionary result so uh, be a little different perspective. So I agree mm -hmm. with what you said. At the same time, I, I, I do think that there can be some radical steps in technology that will be meaningful mm -hmm. and I think will be needed for 2045. And a lot of that is happening in California. Um, full disclosure, I'm going to be channeling, channeling my inner dork here, you know, I'm a <laughs> PhD chemist by training. And uh, so love, love this stuff. Uh, I'm on the board of Caltech, and Caltech has hosted for a number of years a DOE-funded Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. And so I point that to that as an example because it's about thinking about going beyond the technologies that we have today for converting photons into energy to different technologies for converting photons into energy. So I do think there can be there's a potential there for radically different chemistries that go beyond the panels we have today. Even in solar panels, though, um, uh, it the future may not just be silicon; it may be perovskite crystals, right? Which promise to have you know different efficiency, you know, a uh, uh, step up. Uh, I, I would also say, you know, California works in partnership with other states. Uh, one of the gems that we have in the U.S. is a national lab system. So you know, we have some great national labs in in California. Uh, I happen to be on the board of Argonne National Lab, which is in Illinois, but you know, that's. Uh, 
uh, they do a lot of partnership with, with the labs in California. Uh, and I think uh, the battery chemistries are another place where going beyond lithium ion, not just looking at the step function changes, but going to different chemistries will be really critical. Uh, I'll throw two more things out really quickly. One is the underlying computing behind everything that we analyze, model, connect, communicate, that's uh, going to be a major place where California will be contributing significant innovation. And um, I think it was last week, there was a formal announcement of a new new building, new center that's gone up on the Caltech campus in partnership with Amazon to uh, do quantum computing uh, research. So stuff like that is just really exciting. The, the final one I bring up is not just about innovation and technology, and this is something that I think California has really contributed, it's innovation and policy. And, and how do we think about organizing that partnership between government and industry and, and including customers to then actually bring these technologies, deploy them, put them to work, get them paid for, get them supported for those who can't afford them as well as we were talking about earlier. And so whether it's one of the programs that we've done in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission, whether it's what you do with the Energy Commission through you know research funding uh, for groups like we were talking about earlier, like the Electric Power Research Institute, uh, there's a lot of good uh, public policy innovation that California's brought that I think uh, our peers in other states are, are modeling. I, I just, one thing I'd just add to that, we have to be comfortable with some level of risk. You know, with R&D, you know, so we've invested in a whole bunch of chemistries, iron chromium, vanadium, you know, iron air, a bunch of different lithium ion. And, you know, we don't expect every one of those is going to make it over the finish line. That's okay. You know, it's like you got to plant a bunch of seeds to to have a, a tree grow and, and be able to produce fruit. And that's, you know, I, I think you can be too risk averse. Um, and that's just part of the philosophy I think we all need to have going in. We're going to make a bunch of bets here and not everything is going to win, but it's important that you do that and not shy away from that. And in fact, when I think about the US DOE loan program as an example, you know, they have been in the black. They've actually recovered, you know, more money. And I, 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 a little bit, I worry about that because I feel like they should be pushing, you know, a really effective loan program. You kind of want to be taking risks that the private sector won't take. And, um, and that's, you know, that's actually, you know, what, what, Again, what the role of government is that's different from the private sector is to push a little further. You talk a little bit about, and you talk about technology and, and on the clean side and some of the new emerging technologies. Think about it from a customer perspective and technologies that might be able to be useful for uh, two customers. And I was just, interestingly enough, yesterday's panel that I was on, the mayor of Phoenix was talking about they have a now a new position uh, in the city um, around heat and to help them understand how to adapt to this changing climate and particularly heat stress and ensuring that their um, constituents are protected and giving them advice and looking thinking about technology. So one of the things she mentioned was even having a smart enough grid so that they could know in advance if um, an air conditioner was going to fail. And so could go and get that air conditioner replaced, especially when you have high heat days, so that you don't have um, that stress on health and, and uh, premature death. Is there things that you can think about from a consumer perspective that would be really useful and it's coming coming along that you can see really um, helping, again, you know, constituents, our customers, think about the clean energy future in a positive way and be optimistic about what's coming? A couple of quick thoughts. One is, and we've talked about some of these already in the in the panel, but uh, I'll divide it up into things consumers will want to think about and things consumers will not want to think about. And you need to enable both. So uh, I think, you know, the idea of getting in an electric car can be pretty sexy for a lot of consumers. You know, it's a, it's a great feel, great ride. So that's top of mind. Uh, water heaters, probably not something that the average consumer is thinking about, wow, I really want to get that new water heater model, right? And so how, how do you make sure that we have the programs in place that are helping people think about that, make that transition at the point of sale or you know when, when that purchase comes up? So, so that, that'll be kind of a couple of quick thoughts. I would also say that the underlying technology for helping people optimize their energy use, um, you know, we're, I know Southern California Edison is now through the, the latest phase of implementation on time of use rates. You know, that's an important tool. 
I don't think the average consumer really wants to be thinking about that. And so making sure we continue to deploy technology to help enable that uh, in the background seamlessly is, is pretty critical. Uh, one other set of consumers I'll bring up and turn over to David is, I think your question was really about the end use, more retail uh, consumers, but we have to remember that a lot of electricity use is really happening at the, at the large scale at the corporate and industrial level. And that's an exciting area because frankly, these folks are often the early adopters of you know, larger scale new technologies. Uh, you know, we're fortunate within Edison International in addition to having Southern California Edison, we have Edison Energy, which is providing uh, advisory services to large uh, commercial and industrial customers around the country and, and globally now, and uh, serving about 20 of the Fortune 100. Um, and what we're seeing is that technologies that are really relevant, you know, things like not only the you know renewables, but storage, fleet electrification, th those all are important to them in from multiple angles. There's economics, there's reliability and resiliency, but there's also sustainability reasons that these large consumers are, uh, you know, being driven by and you know to, to adopt the new technology. So we need to make sure we're thinking about both that large customer and the, the smaller customer. I think for us, probably the energy efficiency standards are one of the most important things that help people without folks necessarily being aware of it. So a great example, so we set, the Energy Commission sets the efficiency standards for a bunch of appliances in California. So you take televisions, we did that code some years ago and we cut the energy use of TVs in half. And we basically said to the TV industry, you can't sell your product to our 40 million customers unless you comply. And one of the nice things about that, that saves a, about a billion dollars a year for Californians um, in reduced energy prices. But because our market is so big, the manufacturers do not want to run one line to manufacture to the California market and one to manufacture the rest of the country or the world. So in many cases, the California standard becomes the global standard, um, or at a minimum, the North American standard. And that's a really nice bit of market leverage just by virtue of us being that big. We did it with things like your cell phone or your, your shaver. Uh, these things a few years ago, um, you plug them in the wall, even when they're fully charged, they would continue to draw power. Why? Because there's a 25 cent shutoff diode that the manufacturer is electing not to pay for because they don't pay the energy bill. You know, the customer does and they don't want to, we said, no, sorry, you can't sell your product into the state of California without that shutoff diode. And that saves $300 million a year. It's totally, I would say, you know, 99 out of 100 Californians have no idea this stuff happens, but this is where it really matters to have this authority. And it's, it goes to water as well. So we just increased the water efficiency of, you know, toilets, faucets, showerheads, dishwashers, washing machines. You know, we're in a potentially long-term drought. And so we're, we're doing that. That's all very well below the radar, but it does benefit because it, you are saving saving energy and water bills for, for customers. Just gonna pick up on that, David, are you thinking yet about efficiency standards for electric vehicles themselves? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so the answer is I ha we have not contemplated that directly, partly because EVs generally are so much more efficient than internal combustion engine vehicles just by nature of the design and you're spending typically about half the the cost to charge your EV per miles uh, uh, conventional vehicle, but we could very well go into that. And I, I think there's a, you know, I think when we were talking about this the other night, you mentioned, I think it was Tesla has the most efficient and there's certainly room uh, to push. So that's something we, we should look at. Thank you for raising I, I know at every we've had a little bit of discussion about how do, uh, how do help manufacturers think about uh, this from the motor perspective itself, right? Because if you can capture a few percent increase in efficiency, then at the motor yeah. level, that just propagates the, one, the economy. The one thing we are doing, and we have initiated this proceeding, is a tire efficiency standard. And that would apply to all vehicles, um, 28 million vehicles in California. Uh, when they replace their tires, they have to get a, a, a efficient tire. And that actually has the effect of extending the range of electric vehicles. So that's underway now. Um, so one of the things about COP is you have people coming from all over the globe. Uh, sharing lessons learned, hoping to pick up best practices, uh, thinking about just your days here already, and this is Energy Day, but it doesn't have to be specific to energy. Um, any any best practice or lesson learned that you've heard that you think would be applicable to California that we're currently not doing? Well, I'm I'm we're uh, very humble and very eager to learn about offshore wind. We're 
way behind Europe on that. Um, so I actually have been um, the last few weeks touring different offshore wind projects in Portugal and Denmark, and I'll be seeing the one here in Scotland, which is home to the largest floating offshore wind project in the world. We have just one of the positive things about having a new new president in the White House is we have come to an agreement with the Biden administration about a 400 square mile offshore wind zone off the central coast that's been approved. That will go to lease sale in September uh, and we're gonna get offshore wind done in California. It will be a floating project because we have a deep water shelf. And that's one of the, the things that's really exciting to see this floating technology. It's a platform that um, is connected to the seabed with, with three high tension cables. The turbine size is incredible. They're doing 14 megawatt turbines now. The length of the turbine is longer than a football field, 105 meter turbine uh, blades uh, that they're, they're putting in and they're just getting started. I really believe it'll go up to 25 megawatts and more. So I've been learning as much as I can about that. And I just want to take my hats off, my hat off to, to Scotland and, and uh, Denmark and the others here who've been leading that. We have a lot to learn uh, from them. I, I think uh, electric vehicle deployment is another one. I don't know if California is uh, is doing very well at that, but we're certainly seeing European examples of you know continued uh, you know strong government support uh, and uh, and standard setting to help enable that transition and accelerate it. So I think that's one where we can continue to learn. Right. So one of the things that uh, we've been talking about mostly on mitigation. The other thing, the flip side of that coin is adaptation. State and local governments have a lot of responsibility in thinking about climate adaptation, making plans for that sea level rise, heat, uh, increasing drought, as you mentioned, David, and wildfire. So what do you think um, is some things that California should be doing to focus in on the adaptation side of climate change? I can start on that one because, uh, Caroline, as you know, we have been faced with that early on as utilities and have had to uh, significantly increase our focus on hardening the grid against the risk of wildfires and so uh, you know significant capital investment underway to do things like replace uh, standard bare wire with covered conductor and our 27 percent of our 50,000 square miles that are high fire risk areas uh, the public utilities commission has a proceeding underway as, as you know on climate adaptation and uh, sce just happened to be the first utility in, in line to go through the modeling exercise um, I saw some of the model results recently for 2030, 2050, and 2070 projections. I think we saw those together, Caroline. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's scary stuff that we have to go be preparing for. And it's not just wildfire. It's extreme heat. It's drought, as you said. But it's also flooding, right? Because climate change isn't just about the average temperature going up. It's about that average temperature then driving higher volatility uh, across the state. So uh, I think we have a lot of work to do, but we're not alone. All of our peers across other states will have their own versions of climate change impacts to deal with. It might be different different uh, expressions of climate change, but all because of the same underlying driver. So we've been having interesting discussions at the EEI level on how can we as an industry continue to think about uh, uh, common modeling tools for that. EPRI also, I think, is getting engaged in that. And how do we think about uh, you know, a common language around the risk level to, against which we should all be planning uh, consistently across the country. Uh, so this is uh, this is an area that I think we will all be spending a lot of time on in the years ahead. So one thing to keep in mind: something like 150 people died in Portland this summer when they had this extreme heat wave. So Portland's never in its history had 115 degree heat, um, and for some reason, you know. They got it really bad this summer. Um, we we didn't we got heat, but not at that level. That could very well come to California. And I think you know we need to have an equity first strategy on how to keep people cool. So I think electric heat pump technology is really well suited for this. I I really would like to see you know ten billion dollar plus focus on retrofitting out gas appliances, <clears throat> help us decarbonize, and and focus on low income communities get this technology installed to help people uh, who don't have air conditioning today do it, but to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. I think that's an incredible opportunity for both decarbonization and uh, resilience. And that's the kind of thing, you know, we'll see where this federal, you know, reconciliation, reconciliation infrastructure land. But I mean, that, that to me is a huge need. And I think, you know, just generally with the equity first approach, 
that's the right way to do it. Um, and that's, you know, Governor Newsom is leaning all the way into that. As an example, we're doing EV charging right now. We're just spending, my agency is spending a billion dollars on EV charging. We're doing 50% of that in low income disadvantaged communities. Our clean energy demonstration projects, all these storage technologies, we're doing 70% of those projects in low income and disadvantaged communities. And I think that's sort of the, the core strategy as we, you know, build out these solutions to to focus on the the most vulnerable populations. And David, is that paired with funding then for incentives to get low income communities, uh, cut you know, constituents there in vehicles? Yeah, so we have a bunch of incentive programs. We have a big new incentive program, $80 million program for low-income housing to go all electric. Um, and there are higher incentives, of course, for electric vehicles themselves. So that's not our agency that that runs that. But we, we would like to be able, able to offer a lot a lot more of that. I will say one bit of good news. Um, we had a very, very healthy budget last year. And as a result of that, you know, as an example, we did a historic investment in transportation electrification, $3.9 billion. The latest word I'm getting is this coming budget is also going to be very healthy. So hopefully that creates some opportunity for, for bigger investments here. Great. Uh, we have a little time for questions from the audience. If anyone has a question. And we'll repeat it so people can hear it. Yeah, so first of all, just to be hey, clear. David, I, I, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was it. about offshore wind. Uh, how do we get it, transmission to it up in the North Coast? Uh, and first of all, let me say, I am really excited about offshore wind. I think this technology has a very bright future. 80% of US electric demand is in coastal states, if you include the states around the Great Lakes. And what I learned in Denmark, they are doing projects that are 60 miles offshore nobody sees it it has you know virtually no environmental impact and the scale of the technologies you know they're talking about a 40 gigawatt project there to power a bunch of countries um so i think this has you know i would say after rooftop solar i think offshore winds the lowest impact energy generation technology that there is and it's getting to a scale that the costs are going to be comparable with wind on land so um two solutions for uh, the transmission problem there in, in Humboldt, which only has like 150 megawatts of transmission up there, but a great wind resource. One is that we do actually an offshore cable that just connects uh, and you just run the cable basically along the, the the seabed from the north coast all the way down and then, you know, patch in uh, where there's transmission. And of course, we have transmission along the coast in places like Diablo Canyon, which is our last nuclear plant, which is coming offline in 2025. They have That's a 2.2 gigawatt you know, project. So that's certainly uh, one option. Another would be that actually you take surplus power from wind and Humboldt and convert it to hydrogen. And that's that's what, yeah, so some of the developers are talking about that. There's a company in Denmark I just met with that's focused on that. Yeah. Okay. Here's one over. Yes. Could you introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Carlos Garcia from Bloom Energy. We're in yeah. California. I have a technology that I'm optimizing for the public good. Um, and, and if someone were uh, in the employee of uh, Elizabeth Howell's employee in California, I'd like to do something like that. Um, and, and this slide by just kind of taking a lot of notes and, and seeing a lot of the priorities that some of you guys are doing transitioning and EGIP priorities and, um, and, and a lot as well. The,
Yeah, so there's about 600 megawatts of um, data center backup generators, um, a lot of data centers in Silicon Valley. And you're right, they're mostly diesel. They need, um, it's difficult for them to do that with gas uh, just because the energy density. Um, and, you know, I, I hate to see diesel being put in and, and operated. Um, I will say it's a slightly different kettle of fish having it as a backup generator than as an ongoing power plant uh, every day. But it's definitely something we want to um, see a transition on. It's a tough nut to crack. Uh, we did have a workshop on this. Um, and, you know, I'm not aware yet of... Um, companies that have kind of found a way to to move beyond that but there are a couple solutions i think you know bloom energy is certainly one of them um and uh you know we it, it also became an issue because during the um the period where the grid was really stressed uh those those data centers were asked to actually go to uh their backup generator to to reduce load and that you know creates an emission problem so you highlight a very important um issue we got to address Maybe I'll add a little bit to that one, um, and I, I agree with the, the concern, right? Um, David, I think you're absolutely right in differentiating between backup generators that are being used on a more frequent basis versus those that are truly backup. And frankly, one of the challenges the state has had as we dealt with the August 2020 issues, right, that led to brief rotating outages, that was driven by a West White heat dome. It was a really an extreme climate event. Uh, that affected the entire West, you saw uh, a relaxation of standards in order to be able to use one of those backup generators in order to curtail uh, the, you know, the extent of uh, the outage risk. Uh, maybe this is all part of the transition we're in right now from the prior existing fleet of generation resources to where we're headed, one that's more you know, predominantly renewables and storage to you know, provide the, you know, the, the bulk of the electricity. Uh, we need to make sure we're accelerating that transition. So that's why I was so pleased that uh, last week SCE was able to announce, you know, the addition of a couple, uh, a couple hundred megawatts of uh, uh, contracts for third-party storage and another 535 megawatts of utility-owned storage uh, that will be online by next summer. Uh, so I think we need to make sure we're getting the renewables and storage combination. There is definitely a role for hydrogen there, right? And in our view, it's particularly for those hard to electrify applications in the economy. Uh, it is important though to sort through some of the technical issues. So that's why I'm really pleased that uh, EPRI has a five-year partnership with the Gas Technology Institute for a project called the LCRI, Low Carbon Resources Initiative, that is going deeper into what are some of the technical uh, potential and issues to be solved uh, with low carbon fuels like hydrogen for places where they'll be needed in the economy in the long run. It's Take the last question here. You know, obviously we're here for climate. Climate cha change is, I think, the challenge of our generation. You two have been uh, working at it for uh, a number of years. What keeps you optimistic and what's next for your organizations? Great question. Well, I, I have to say I've met some of the most inspiring and visionary people in my life uh, through working on this challenge. And so I really draw a lot of hope um, from, from the entrepreneurs and from my colleagues uh, as incredible, incredibly dedicated public servants, uh, private sector leaders such as yourselves, um, uh, and so many others that just, that, that really um, recharges my tank. I think this last few years, I don't recall another time in my life when there's been that many colossal challenges compressed into such a short period. We were dealing with you know, threats to democracy, you know, smoke from the fires, you know, blackouts, recession, a pandemic, and uh, you know, it, it can really weigh on your soul. Um, but then when you look around and you see the, the incredible 
beauty of the human spirit of people uh, trying to make things better. That really, for me, that really uh, keeps me going. And um, I love what I do. I feel um, super excited to keep going. Um, and, and for me, the main vision I'm interested in is really extending the reach of this clean electric grid as broadly as we can. Uh, so really, you know, aggressive electrification on things that can't be electrified, you know, converting them to other solutions, including hydrogen that get us off fossil fuels. We have to get off fossil fuels. I think that message is, is clear. Um, and uh, we have an incredible opportunity, this window right now, uh, to actually make some real progress. So I want to make my, my time count. The pandemic gave us an amazing example of the global community coming together to solve a problem and do it quickly. Just a level of scientific and policy, government collaboration, and then you know there's the public pitching in, wearing our masks, right, uh, washing our hands, all that. Think about the global, you know, global collaboration to try and temper a pandemic because it was an existential crisis. Well, you know, the climate crisis is just as existential. And so what's ahead is making sure that we're doing our part as a company to partner with, you know, frankly, great leaders like you, David, uh, with folks in the state level, folks at local levels, folks at the federal level, other companies, you know, peer companies, customer companies, other sectors. Uh, we have to come together to, to solve this because otherwise we're not going to be leaving uh, much other than a mess for our kids and their kids. So we, we have to make sure we prevent that. What excites me about it, it's, you know, those people we get to work with, and it's my 13,000 teammates across Edison International and Southern California Edison and Edison Energy. Uh, there's a real sense of mission in our company. Obviously, you know, we're an investor-owned utility uh, holding company. We uh, you know, have to make sure that we're doing all the right things in terms of business, but it's a place that has a sense of public service because what we're doing is so ingrained with, uh, you know, with, with helping the broader economy, helping our communities. And so that's pretty darn satisfying. That's what's kept me here. And uh, I have a little extra gray hair from wildfires and pandemics <laughs> and all of that. But you know what? Uh, at least I have 13,000 uh, friends to go uh, deal with all that stuff and uh, work for a better future. So that, that's what excites me, Carolyn. Carolyn, you've been asking us the question. I'd love to hear yeah. how you'd answer that yourself. Oh, I actually w would echo the sentiments that you both expressed. I do think that it, what we've seen to date has been innovation, ingenuity, and a common purpose. And I see that continuing. And with that, I, I think we will prevail, you know, with the engineering, the, 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 the real imagination that people are bringing to this challenge. And it is working together across government and private sector and customers and communities with our EJ community partners and other environmental nonprofits to, to get to the solutions. But I see that common mission and common purpose and the sense of urgency. You know, one of the themes, obviously, that we've already heard here at COP26 is no more blah, blah, blah. And let's get to the action and really move forward because we do only have eight years to get to the 2030 targets. And I see that sense of purpose and mission and moving that forward uh, with that sense of urgency. So it's, it's really been fantastic. So I want to thank you both for joining me here today and um, thank you all for, for joining us as well.